The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the African China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the SubChina Network. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, today we're going to be talking about infrastructure and financing and debt, and we're going to get to that part of our discussion. We've got a fantastic guest here today to do to join us to talk about that. But before we get to that, I think it's important that this week we address uh, a very important issue that has now kind of just arrived on the scene in the China-Africa space, and that is the coronavirus in Wuhan, China. Now, one of the uh, exciting parts of what's happened over the past 10 years is the closer integration of China and Africa. That is now hundreds of thousands of Chinese live in Africa. There are direct daily flights coming to and from uh, China and Africa, most notably through Kenya, South Africa, uh, also in Ethiopia and Addis Ababa. But that also brings up one of the downsides that when we have a communicable disease like this, a virus that is potentially deadly, it is very difficult to contain, uh, it does reveal, Cobus, one of the shortcomings and one of the potential dangers in the relationship. Yes, everything is more interconnected. Um, and, you know, when things become more interconnected, they also become more volatile and more kind of harder to harder to control um i think also you know this is this is an early indicator of i think of that of a problem that i think we're going to have a lot more in the in this century which is um that these kind of you know pandemics or potential pandemics are going to be exacerbated by climate change um and it, of course climate change is itself exacerbated by by lots of air travel and uh, and possibly pandemics might be exacerbated by lots of air travel so this is a really difficult thing to solve and it's particularly in the china africa space is particularly worrisome i think you know kind of it's particularly because africa has so, such so few resources to actually deal with a, this kind of crisis so the key question right now kobe since if this actually makes it to africa what happens? And I contend that this would be a a devastating outcome of what happens here. In As of the time of this recording, we have not heard any statement coming out of Ethiopian Airlines. And I think that is the one that people want to hear from, because Ethiopia now is one of the main gateways into Africa from China, where they're flying daily flights from Shanghai and Beijing, and they're adding in three new cities as well. Uh, what is Ethiopian Airlines going to do to make sure that they're screening passengers coming through their Addis gateway? Uh, in Nigeria right now, the Nigeria Centers for Disease Control, they have been the most communicative of any African country and an African agency right now uh, on their Twitter feed, setting up uh, showing pictures of the screening set centers that they're setting up. They're doing interagency task force. Uh, and in Kenya now, they're all starting to screen passengers coming from Wuhan and from China uh, through Jomo Kenyatta International Airport. Uh, Kobus, I haven't heard much coming out of South Africa. But again, this is something that uh, African public health authorities, in my view, should be ramping up very quickly because China can take care of this. They have the experience from the 2002-2004 SARS uh, epidemic that broke out. They also have a political system that allows people to allows them to exert much more control over their population, and they have the money, the resources, and the technical staff to do to deal with this. Uh, all of that is not the same in 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 all African countries. So what happens, Cobus, if we do see the arrival of coronavirus in, in places like uh, South Africa, Nigeria, or Kenya? Well, you know, then hmm, what will happen? I mean, you know, the, the, there will have to be, of course, some kind of mitigation, some, some form of, um, of quarantine. Um, and in, in, in that sense, I think, you know, the, the, the World Health Organization and other, other of similar bodies will have sets of, of guidelines to deal with. Um, they will also learn from China's own experience in dealing with these these kind of crises, both in positive and in negative ways. In some kind of ways, China has been quite efficient in dealing with it. But as we saw in, during the SARS, um, you know, outbreak in in the early two thousands, there was a lot of uh, of secrecy, um, which at this time the the Communist Party actually explicitly instructed officials to to not keep secrets. 
And then, of course, you know, Africa should also then learn from 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 the kind of bad example in China of how China treated African migrants um, suspected of having Ebola, um, you know, which was or just simply any kind of African migrants during the Ebola crisis, which was to treat them quite badly, actually. Um, you know, during that time, um, if you remember, you know, Africans were frequently isolated for weeks on end, you know, kind of without without any real kind of grounds, without, you know, displaying any symptoms, for example. So, so in that sense, you know, kind of China is, is both, a, a, I think, a good example in some cases and a bad example in others. So this is an issue that we are covering every day in our email newsletter. If you want to subscribe to that newsletter, go to our website, chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. Subscriptions are $149 a year, but $7 a month for students or $75 a year for academics. So you can find out all the rates. But this is the kind of coverage that we provide on a daily basis uh, if you're interested in China Africa news. Okay, let's Put that aside for now. We're going to come back to the coronavirus topic probably in the, in the weeks ahead because this doesn't seem like a story that's going away anytime soon. But we're going to talk today about infrastructure financing. And Cobus, this has been one of the key issues that we've seen emerge in 2020. Uh, we've talked towards the end of last year about an evolution away from what's called the Angola model of financing towards something that's called the China-Africa swaps. What this implies is that there is an evolution in the way that China Chinese are financing infrastructure in Africa. We don't have a lot of details on this, but we're piecing it together that it implies that there is a mitigation of risk from the Chinese, that they don't want to be on the hook for all this debt. They also seem to be taking to heart some of the accusations from the U.S. about predatory lending and the debt trap. And at the same time, there is concern about debt sustainability on the African side, that we're looking at a number of different African countries now that have crossed the 50% threshold of debt-to-GDP ratio, and yet there is still the demand to finance lots and lots of infrastructure. So the key question that we're going to talk about today, Cobus, is where are we going with infrastructure financing? Because Africa's need for infrastructure is not going down, but China's willingness to lend might at the same time be easing off a little bit. Um, at the same time, in Africa, you also have continuous stories of bad de bad deals with China, frequently deals that that don't deliver the kind of infrastructure that that was promised. Um, you know, you know, uh, inappropriate technology being used, um, like a lack of control over the projects by by the African governments who are then on the hook for repaying that debt. Um, you know, so so there's there is a lot of dissatisfaction in Africa with Ch these kind of Chinese deals, um, and. So it then raises the question of how much decision-making power African governments have when they negotiate these deals, and also how how much power African publics have for to to get the kind of in full information, the full terms of the of the deals that are then agreed. And that is exactly what we're going to talk about today: is the agency or the power on the African side of this negotiation. Frankton Chiamira is a lecturer in international development at the Open University in Milton Keynes which is just outside of London. First time we've ever gone to Milton Keynes. Uh, Frankton is a, is a specialist in Africa-China engagements with a particular focus on Chinese financing and development of critical infrastructure. He completed his PhD on Ethiopia-China engagement in wind energy, uh, infrastructure financing, and development. A very good afternoon to you, Frankton, from Milton Keynes outside of London. Good afternoon, Eric. Uh, good afternoon, Kobas. Um, thanks for inviting me. I'm quite honored to be involved in the China Africa project. I've been following this for some time, and I'm happy that at least now I'm now a participant. Oh, well, it's our pleasure because I've been following you on Twitter for quite some time. So, And we'll give your Twitter information later in the show, but Frankton is a guy you actually do want to follow because he posts some very interesting things. Uh, let's get right to it. You wrote an article on December 28th. Uh, last year in Addis Fortune uh, with a very provocative headline, Chinese infrastructure financing is Ethiopia naive. Now, to understand all of this, let me just give a little bit of background to what you did with your PhD is back in 2017 and 18, you interviewed 116 Ethiopian government officials and employees of Chinese enterprises. So you really spoke with a lot of people who were involved in the Adama 1 and Adama 2 wind energy projects. And I love the fact that you spoke with both Ethiopian and Chinese. Now, in your paper uh, in Addis Fortune, your article, 
you said, and let me quote right in your conclusion. I'm just going to get right to the point here, Frankton. Uh, the findings of your study help to push back against claims and assumptions that the Chinese dominate the African decision-making process in infrastructure financing and development. That's the key question here, because when we hear accusations from the West, most notably the United States, that China is entrapping countries like Ethiopia in debt, it implies that Ethiopians are naive or ignorant, or they don't understand this, and it's up to the Americans or the Europeans to inform them that the Chinese are doing something that is, well, entrapment. What's your take on this? Uh, well, thanks for, for, for that um, entry, uh, point of entry. Uh, so I've been involved in um, Ethiopia-China uh, engagements for some time, and I've been following the developments, I think, as far as 2014. And um, in responding to some of the uh, media claims and even some policy perspective from our Western institutions and think tanks, uh, which sort of, uh, you know, advance the argument that the Chinese dominate Africans in the infrastructure uh, financing and development decision making. I was informed by this and I wanted to explore this further at a very empirical level to see if that was the case. So then I decided to at least work on the, on the wind farms, um, which is Adama 1 and Adama 2 wind farms in Ethiopia. Uh, which were uh, financed by the Chinese Export and Import Bank um, and by the Ethiopian government at the rate of 85% to 15% ratio. So I use these case studies then to sort of ask, is really the case that the Chinese dominate the Africans' uh, infrastructure financing and development decision-making? I spent quite a number of uh, months, uh, approximately, you know, uh, around 10 months in Ethiopia, uh, speaking to various uh, Ethiopian and Chinese um, uh, personnel who were involved uh, either at the early stages of the of the projects or who were involved in the implementation of the, of those uh, wind farms. So what I find is quite interesting, and it sort of like reject that narrative, uh, positioning Ethiopian government as sort of being in charge of the way it interacts uh, with the Chinese. Can you unpack that a little bit? Like what, you know, kind of how how did the Ethiopian government's agency, how did it manifest in, in, in the negotiations with the Chinese? So when I was doing my PhD, I had uh, about like four areas that I was looking or that I was exploring on this idea of African agents. So the first one basically had to do with uh, what I uh, what I refer to as the strategizing aspect. So in this regard, I was looking at how did the idea of developing wind farms came about. So that feeds into issues of the policy framework, the planning around the development of these wind farms. So what I found was that, uh, in fact, it was a product of the Ethiopian government to initially come up with the idea of developing wind farms. I mean, this partly comes from um, uh, the dependency that the Ethiopian government has always had on hydropower, uh, which I think by then was, even up to now as we speak, is about 89 to 92 percent uh, in terms of uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, the, uh, the ratio or the proportion of the electricity infrastructure or sector in Ethiopia. So the idea of developing wind farms there was then seen as a way of diversifying uh, the, the source of energy production in Ethiopia, for which wind was quite uh, was one of them. And th there is also another element that I also explored uh, in terms of uh, how then uh, the Ethiopian government exercised agents. So I, I, I refer to it uh, as the concept of uh, like the financial aspect of it, the financial negotiations. Uh, how did the Ethiopian government then specifically negotiate it with the Chinese to get a favorable deal? Um, and then the third one had to do with the aspect of implementation and management. And uh, then the last one being uh, the operations and maintenance aspect of these wind farms. Of course, I'll come back to uh, each of these uh, uh, four aspects as we go further with the discussion. Yeah, let's dive into some of those, because what I'd like to better understand is in the relationship, the discussions between the Chinese and Ethiopians, and maybe we're using Ethiopians as a proxy for other African governments as well. It's The assumption is that the Chinese, because they're so much wealthier, so much bigger, because they, can, they have the, the skills, the technology, that they really set the terms 
for the negotiations. And again, there is a very uh, prominent victimization theme that kind of strains through a lot of Africa's negotiations with the outside world. That again, and I think this is not just the West and U.S. that are saying that Africa is being victimized by China. I think there's a lot of people who also in Africa who also feel that as well. You, though, say that's not the case. You actually say that Ethiopians have a lot stronger position. Um, let me just again quote, go back to your article. And you said that the ability of the Ethiopian government to shape and influence their interactions with the Chinese and infrastructure projects is more complicated than ordinarily assumed. Can you be specific to us about those complications and how the Ethiopians, in fact, have agency in this discussion with the Chinese over infrastructure? You know, the thing is that um, here the Africans or the Ethiopian, to be precise, they are the ones who sort of want the financial assistance from the Chinese. So in that regard, it can be interpreted as they cannot make demands or they cannot put some uh, requirements on the table when negotiating with someone who will be interested in financing their uh, their development uh, uh, program. But one thing that people at the end of the day also tend to forget is that uh, the Chinese some are also interested in doing business in Africa. So uh, forget about the politics. Uh, for me, I look at it from an economic perspective and then how the economics feed into the politics. So first and foremost, you realize that the Chinese will not be interested in financing any project that does that is not bankable or, or at the end of the day, they will not have some financial returns from that. So if we enter into negotiations with that mindset, then you have to start on an equal footing. So what, what, what that implies is that then it will be the responsibility of that particular country that is interested in getting the finance from the Chinese to first do their homework and know what the Chinese can do and cannot do. Then when knowing this, then you can make informed decision when negotiating uh, the financing terms and conditions of these uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, so for example, uh, what I found in my research was that um, uh, the the development of Adama Wind Farm was tra- is traced from around 2006, I think. Uh, by that time, we had uh, the former Ethiopian Prime Minister, uh, uh, Mele Zenawi, who sort of probably realized the potential of the Chinese in uh, wanting to develop uh, Africa's infrastructure. Um, the reason why the Meles government sort of looked to the Chinese was partly because of the uh, some of the pressure that they were receiving from the Western institution who were sort of like putting some conditionalities, uh, be it in terms of governance reforms or be it on issues of human rights, of which the Ethiopian government by then was not so sort of looking forward, was not so interested in sort of adapting or adjusting to those uh, those pressures and demands. So China emerged or came up at the right time. And at the same time, we also saw that China was starting to emerge uh, as, as, a, a, as a global player. And so that synergy between um, the pushback against the Western institution and the desire from the Chinese side to present itself as a global power. So when they met halfway, then it created a very perfect situation for uh, Ethiopia uh, to exploit uh, the relations. You know, kind of one, one of the ter- one of the issues that is um, frequently the most controversial um, around these deals is the issue of not only debt but also the the interest rate to the debt and the the repayment schedule. Um, how did the Ethiopian government manage to to negotiate that part of it? And to which extent were were those negotiations actually open to the public? And to which extent were the public only told afterwards what the terms were? Uh, what I found in my in my research in Ethiopia is that uh, um, so the negotiation team was composed mainly uh, by uh, some personnel from the Ethio, Ethio China uh, Development Cooperation Directorate, uh, which is within the uh, Ethiopian Ministry of Finance and Economic Cooperation. But also there were some other uh, uh, supporting personnel which were drawn from Ethiopia Electric Power. Uh, some were drawn from the Ethiopian Ministry of Water, uh, uh, Irrigation and Electricity. And um, so this line or supporting institutions sort of were involved in different types of negotiation. But for all the financial related negotiations, they were all handled by the uh, Ministry of Finance. Uh, so when I went through some of the initial or uh, sort of like pro- 
proposition for funding this project. For example, uh, for Adama 2, what I found, the original amount was about 528 million. Uh, and then for Adama 1 was about 123 uh, million. But uh, when I then started to evaluate the contract doc the contractual document which I had access to, I ended up realizing that, um, uh, for example, for Adama 2, the amount had like been significantly reduced to around 345 million. Uh, uh, and then the, the, the Adama one had also not significant, but uh, there were some uh, reductions to about 117 million uh, US dollars. Of course, these negotiations were not open to the public uh, because it's only handled by the Ethiopian Minister of Finance. So what happened then after these negotiations and the deliberations, the outcome then is then communicated uh, probably to the, pal uh, to the parliament because the parliament then had to ratify uh, uh, the agreements uh, in that regard. What's the incentive for the Ethiopian government to keep this process opaque and I know why the Chinese, they like to have as little transparency as possible in their dealings. But when you were looking into in doing your research and looking into the to these contracts, was it difficult for you to get access to the documents from the Ethiopian side? Uh, it's it's quite difficult to to get some of the information, like in any other African country, I think. Um, but the good thing with the Ethiopian case is that all the financial agreements, at some point in time, they have they have to be ratified by the parliament, so it has to go through the parliament for approval. Uh, but what I con what I read from this is that the parliament simply uh, approves or ratify the deals that let's say the the, the government would have already agreed uh, on. So it's sort of like um, a normal bureaucratic process where they just have to do the approval and ratification uh, in that regard. So there's no oversight there. They're not challenging the prime minister on this deal. They're not serving as a check and balance on this. They're basically a rubber stamp. Whatever the prime minister's office agrees to with the Chinese, then the parliament just kind of says, good, we're ready to go. Uh, of course. one I, I wouldn't really say that the, the prime minister sort of agrees, but what I've seen is that... Um, uh, so we, in fact, we have got various levels of actors doing different responsibilities at a given point in time. Uh, so what happens is that, the, for example, the Ethiopian prime minister by then could sort of set the tone, the agenda uh, of what needs to be deliberated or what needs to be negotiated on. Then the actual negotiation of the project implementation, the financing, the technical aspects, uh, the environmental impact assessment, then were then given or were distributed to the line managers or, or line ministries which would actually do the job i think that is where we see if you want agents at work in the sense that the ethiopian government then would create several institutions for which the chinese would be expected to deal with or negotiate with at a given point in time as i said the financing aspect was all handled by the ethiopian china development cooperation directorate which is within the ministry of finance but if you go to the technical side then you see now there's the ethiopian ministry of water and irrigation and then we also have the ethiopian electric power so that somehow for me, it shows how serious the government is in terms of uh, its interaction with the Chinese and in sort of like setting the pace and, and, and the way in which these uh, engagements unfold. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at WitsChinaAfrica or visit AfricaChinaReporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. Um, one of the big challenges in Africa is is um, getting the labor mix right. You know, kind of this uh, the, the importation of Chinese labor into Africa is very controversial among African uh, populations, but in some cases, especially in, in in technical fields, it might sometimes be hard to find um, you know African personnel with the required skill level, particularly in specializations like you know wind power engineering. How did the Ethiopian government handle that situation? Yeah, that's very correct. Uh, so what I've noticed is that um, so in Ethiopia, there is a labor proclamation which sort of specify the amount of uh, time or periods a foreign worker can live or can work in Ethiopia. So at most it's, uh, and it's three years. 
and it has to be somehow ratified i think by the ministry of uh by the minister of labor if there is need to ex, uh, sort of like extend that person's stay except if it's in the management uh like the executive or the directorate level of uh, that given firm um so it was part actually of the contract that um, uh, the Ethiopian government stated that majority of the uh, employees in those two wind farms were supposed to be local and what i found for example in Adama 1 um there were about 1100 empl- uh, workers at, at uh, uh, like at most and you'll find that uh, 800 of these were ethiopian and about 300 uh, were were chinese and that is the case as well in Adama 2 about um, 1,200 were Ethiopian and uh, 280 were Chinese and other foreign experts. So I think the Ethiopian government really has control on that. And as I've said, uh, this labor proclamation, they ensure that they give visas to people who are going to do uh, some work which the local uh, industry or, you know, or let's say it's not found within Ethiopia. And so I think for me, and it's not only just the existence of the proclamation, but also the strict enforcement. I remember sort of chatting with some uh, uh, some uh, personnel from Ethiopian Investment Commission who were saying it's quite simple for us. So they go through like the uh, yearly reports of, of these companies involved in Ethiopia. And some of the things that they look for is to check how many uh, uh, Ethiopians are employed and how many foreigners are employed and they sort of try to monitor that. So in, in some way, it gives the Ethiopian government then the ability to approach, let's say, a Chinese firm to say, like, look, you're violating the agreement here. You are supposed to employ, let's say, maybe 10 percent foreign, then 80 percent, 90 percent are local. But of course, there is no sort of like a lo- local content, uh, uh, let's say, distribution or ratio to say 30 percent local or maybe 70 percent, uh, say 70 percent local, 30 percent international. It's not there, but it's just with the contracts of, of these infrastructure projects. It's interesting because your findings echo those of Professor Carlos Oya from the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, also Barry Soutman and Professor Yen Hairong in Hong Kong. Uh, one after another, researchers such as yourselves have found that the uh, perception that the Chinese are importing vast amounts of labor into Africa simply isn't accurate. They're bringing in expert talent and managerial talent that may not be found locally, but they're not bringing in large numbers of workers. But yet the perception still is out there that the Chinese are, in fact, importing large numbers uh, of workers. Why do you think that is? I I think the rise of China and its increasing role in Africa sort of like feed into uh, this narrative in particular emerging from the West where they feel and sense that they are losing ground in Africa and in most cases then they use media sort of like to fight his battle on their behalf I think this is this is my reading of uh, of it and there are some other like dubious accusation uh, which sort of like feed into the mainstream uh, uh, media uh, and I, I think It's only through such kind of empirical studies that we can push back uh, uh, against uh, such claims. But one thing I I should have also highlighted is that uh, although in the Ethiopian context, like more than 70 percent were locals, what you tend to see when you zoom into this uh, 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 workers portfolio, you would see that the management aspect or let's say maybe more technical position of uh, within this infrastructure projects tend to be dominated by uh, by by the by the uh, chinese and i mean the reason for that at least as for my study was because there were no uh, local uh, local people who, who were you know uh, qualified to be undertaking such uh, positions you know so that's something i think i hinted on towards the end of my article that uh, I think there is more needed in terms of how can we uh, transfer the necessary skills, uh, those those high end skills, so that uh, by the end of this infrastructure, uh, by the end of this uh, pro- uh, infrastructure development projects, then all the necessary skills would have been transferred to Africans. If you could advise other African governments outside of Ethiopia on which lessons to take to to better negotiate with the Chinese and to, to get better deals out, out of Chinese partners. What kind of quick takeaways would you would you recommend for them? 
So the first thing for me has to do with the planning aspect. So the African governments should plan what they need to achieve within what given period and who are they going who are they looking forward to uh, be assisted in that in that plan. So if they do not have plans for these projects then it's going to be difficult in terms of identify who or where is the potential uh, source of financing. So that is the first element for me, the planning aspect. So, for example, the Ethiopian government then, uh, having identified that they had a massive wind resource potential, then they approached the Chinese institution to say, look, can you help us specifically with a EPC model uh, plus financing for developing this wind farm? I mean, you can see from this that the Ethiopian government had already planned and strategized in terms of who were they looking forward to in terms of looking for assistance. So that is the first element uh, that I, I advise African governments to plan properly and strategize uh, 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 again. Then the second bit is the aspect of the financial negotiations. Uh, what I would advise most of the African governments is to do their homework in terms of doing other, let's say, side project evaluations. For example, if they need to construct a road from point A to point B, they can maybe consult other firms or other institutions to see how much will this road possibly cost so that when they do the negotiations with the Chinese, they are informed by some form of other ideas and other uh, information. Then they can use it to compare that or even push against maybe high interest rate or maybe higher project value. Uh, at least then they will be making informed decision. And then, then the other thing has to do with uh, probably the issue of implementation and management, where the Africans will have to set aside or put into place some sort of like local, uh, local content in the sense like, for example, uh, if it's the issues of uh, labor or employment patterns, then let's say 70 or 80 percent should be local, or then 20 percent maybe should be foreign. Um, and then also, if possible, to try and use as much as local institutions in the value chain of these projects, you know. Uh, for example, supply of basic materials such as cement. Um, I remember uh, the Ethiopian government say, telling me that uh, what we asked the Chinese was to tell us what sort of cement do you want for developing these wind farms. And then they had to uh, use Muga, which is uh, a national-owned uh, cement company, to sort of produce the cement that met, that met the requirements uh, of uh, of the Chinese standards to, uh, to, to be used in those wind farms. So I think there is that need to have a clear local content policy uh, and law if need be. And uh, then the last one, I think, for me is uh, probably to do with uh, the, this idea of ownership. Um, um, for example, under which model is the infrastructure project going, project going to be delivered, uh, who is going to own that project, um, and who is going to do the maintenance of that project. So what I would advise in most cases, if needed, is to sort of negotiate for a separate maintenance, uh, operation and maintenance contract. So let's say you will have one Chinese company that will be involved only in the, let's say, the construction. Then if need be, then negotiate for a separate maintenance aspect so that you don't lock in yourself in one Chinese uh, uh, firm or Chinese, or like let's say one or two Chinese firm. And there at least you can extract uh, more benefits uh, from that. So those are the four items I think I would sort of like advise African governments when negotiating or you know, thinking about engaging with the Chinese infrastructure development. That is sound advice, and I do hope that a lot of our friends in various African governments are listening to you because it would make for a much healthier relationship uh, between China and Africa and certainly alleviate some of the pressures on the debt issues by taking into account some of what you said. Uh, Frank Chiamura is a lecturer in international development at the Open University in Milton Keynes outside of London. Uh, as you can see, he is a specialist on Ethiopia-China engagement, uh, specifically in wind energy, and we're going to ask Frankton to come back to talk to us about wind and new energy development because that is a whole other topic which is really important which we didn't have a chance to touch on today uh, but he's also a specialist in infrastructure financing and development and this is one of the topics that he writes a lot about uh, on his twitter feed frankton uh, what's the best way to people to find you on twitter uh, so it's at f c h e m u r a uh, so that's my twitter handle um, then I'm also on LinkedIn, uh, Frankton Chiamura, 
and uh, on Facebook, Frank Chiemura. So that's F R A N K, uh, then C H I Y E M U R A. Wonderful. Well, I will put links to all of that in the show notes so that people can reach out and and touch base with you as well. We want to thank you so much for joining us and taking the time to talk to us about some of the amazing research you've done. Thank you very much. Kobus, the most interesting takeaway for me from Frankton's comments and also reading his article is how much more complex the negotiations are and the dealings are and how much more agency Africans have than the U.S., led debt trap narrative gives it credit for. And again, all year last year, we heard the criticisms coming out of Washington and American stakeholders about the dangers of debt trap lending, of predatory lending, and all of this stuff. And none of that has any nuance to it. And when you actually talk to specialists like Frankton, who are on the ground, they bring you the complexity that's missing in the debt trap argument. And I'm not trying to belabor the debt trap argument, but it is, to me, something very interesting because I feel that the debt trap argument gets internalized in Africa and elsewhere simply because it is so commonplace. But I hope that at some point, some of Frankton's comments also join that discussion because he brings complexity to an issue that is, I think, too often oversimplified. Yes, and he also brings the African side, you know, the the African decision-making um, and the, the kind of African calculations that, that come into the deal. Um, you know, w- one of the things that I find very frustrating about the debt trap narrative as we see it at the moment is that it it closes down discussions about how how Africa should work with China. You know, because because the the entire um, narrative is based essentially on this fantasy of of, of China that is has is endless amounts of money and therefore you know it can use this money for nefarious kind of leveraged um, purposes. It leaves out the real the real kind of concerns that the Chinese have on about being on the hook for all of this debt. Um, and therefore, it leaves out a way of moving towards towards improving the the kind of ways that the China and Africa work together. Of course, improving the ways that China and Africa work together is exactly the kind of thing that that the, the in many kind of State Department officials are not interested in, um, and that's the very reason why we have the debt trap narrative to begin with. But you know, kind of, I find it I find it unfortunate um, because it tends to I think it, it 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 leads to a lot of bad information being circulated and that a chance to actually improve the dealings with a very important development partner being closed down. The one area where I was a little skeptical of Frankton's comments, it was the fact that there doesn't seem to be any oversight within the procurement process. So as he indicated, it goes from uh, an office within the prime, minister, prime minister's purview over to parliament, and then it then goes to the, back to the various committees. And that is more or less a closed loop within the Ethiopian government. And so we're still not seeing the input from civil society stakeholders, from any kind of audit or oversight to ensure that these deals, A, are in the best interest of the people and the use of their tax money, but B, to kind of reduce the corruption that does exist within this, because we do know that there is corruption in the process. There's corruption in every governmental process. And when you have this much money slushing its way through, invariably there's going to be corruption. And having more transparency would definitely, I think, make people feel better about the process. And this is, again, where the Chinese, I think, fall down in that their need or their demand and their insistence for opacity uh, ultimately hurts them. And nothing that I heard from Frankton really made me feel better about what's going on in Ethiopia. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, but, you know, then the South African ex- counterexample is, you know, is even more depressing in the sense that South Africa does have several institutions that are supposed to play this check and balance, balance role. And it has a strong civil society. And this, they are usually with these kind of projects, they, they are supposed to be uh, space or time, you know, time frames for public comment. But then in some cases in South Africa, you know what we saw during the Jacob Zuma era was that these these um, oversight um, bodies became corrupt themselves. You know they were kind of infiltrated by by some of the same some of the, the similar people who infiltrated the the parastatal companies. Um, you know so it's not necess- it's not necessarily the situation that just because you have those institutions that they're actually going to be doing their job. Um, you know kind of which is which then you know is, is the the kind of wider the wider kind of landscape in Africa, which can sometimes be quite depressing. 
or you have the problem that we have in the United States, which is that so much input from outside stakeholders ultimately makes it difficult to get anything done. It takes four years just to build a small bridge or a road. And one of the advantages that the Chinese have is, as we talked about in Ghana, where they went in just 18 months from negotiation to a shovel in the ground, is the lack of any type of involvement from outside stakeholders makes it so that they can move really fast. There is an advantage to that, but the downside is is that people don't know what's going on. And when they don't know what's going on, it creates an information vacuum that all sorts of things get filled in there. So something to think about. Uh, Well, listen, that'll do it for this edition. We're going to continue our discussion on infrastructure, new energy, sustainability. All of these topics that Frankton kind of talked about are many of the key themes that we have forecasted for the year ahead. These are also the key themes that we talk about uh, every day in our newsletter and on our subscription service on our website. So if you're interested in subscribing to the China Africa Project, you are supporting independent journalism. This is something that Cobus and I do. Uh, We are uh, fully self-funded and independent from any corporations or any countries. We don't take any of that kind of money. We just depend on some foundation grants and also your subscriptions. So there is a an act of uh, doing good journalism here and doing some kindness to support independent media, uh, but also more importantly for you to get a daily intelligence brief on what's going on in the China-Africa space. That's why uh, people from the State Department, the UN, Jetro in Japan, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I mean, you name it, they're subscribing to it. So if they're reading it every day, it might be interesting for you as well. So go find out more at ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. Uh, Listen, Kobus and I will be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. For Kobus Fenstaden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to Facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter where you can find Kobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China in Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com. <laughs>